the clinical use of radiosurgery. The radiosurgery unit is an alternative to the soft tissue dental laser. This is a case that was treated with a laser and you can see the char layer on the lower right where the lasing has been done. And this is the way, once that char layer is wiped away, we can see on the lower slide the post-op with the tissue reduction and pocket reduction that was accomplished. The laser uses a light wave, vaporizes tissue, does not burn the nerve endings. It's sim relatively painful, very effective, and a wonderful instrument for removing soft tissue surgery for removing soft tissue and just cut off surgery. Another case, we can see the red and tissue on the central and lateral, and we can see the area where this has been lased, and we see the area on the lower approximately two weeks later. When I was in practice, I typically waited three weeks for doing post-ops to allow for more tissue maturity. So many of the cases in this we're gonna be showing in this presentation are perhaps longer than two weeks, most of them being about a three-week post-op. Now, what is radiosurge? It's a completely different concept from electrocautery or electrosurgery. With electrosurgery, we have a lower frequency, deeper penetration, generates heat, uh, significant tissue destruction. However, with radiosurgery, we use a higher frequency, shallower penetration, minimal heat, there's minimal tissue destruction, and the healing takes place very similar to the way it is when the laser has been used. This is a unit that I have used for many years. It's the Dental Surge 90, which was developed by the uh, Elman Company, Dr. Elman, and I think this actual unit was probably made in the late 60s. You will see a port here where an antenna is placed a second port where the cord that goes to the electrode tip is placed. And on the top of that, we see several settings or modes of cutting. We see a filtered cut, and that is 90% cutting and 10% coagulation. The next setting is a cutting mode and a coagulation mode with 50% cutting and 50% coagulation. The third setting is only 10% cutting and 90% coagulation, and this would probably be considered electrosurgery. The unit setting that I prefer to use, or the mode I prefer to use 99% of the time, is I want a cutting mode and I don't want coagulation. Remember, coagulation is burning of tissue, and we simply want to cut the tissue as we would with a laser and allow it to heal painlessly. Just for your information, we can see the waveform on the oscilloscope on our, our fully rectified filter or the, uh, the cutting mode. This is the one that's 90% cutting and 10%. And you can see the changes that take place in that waveform as we increase the uh, intensity. Now, below that is a dial that goes from 1 to 10. And you will see in this slide that it is set on a 4. I usually start by setting it, cutting it on on the filtered cut that we talked about before, 90% cutting, 10% coagulation, and then set the dial on the bottom to about a four. And as I begin to go to the mouth and use it, I may increase that to about a seven, depending on the uh, resistance we had in the room. Now remember, this is a radio wave and if you have a radio in the operatory, that will interfere with this and increase the need for energy. So you need to cut off the radio if you're going to use this. I mentioned the antenna. First of all, the antenna is not a ground. Basically what the antenna does, it focuses the radio waves. You will notice here that we place the antenna as close as possible to the radio, uh, to the radio surgery site and that means that we can reduce the intensity. And as I said earlier on the previous slide, by using the little rheostat dial on that, we can really get down and do some very precise cutting with this instrument. We talked about the waveform earlier, 
and we have the fully filtered cut. And with the fully filtered cut, we have a minimum lateral coagulation or burning and the least heat. When we go to the fully rectified or the cutting mode, which as we said earlier, is 50-50 as far as cutting and coagulation, we have moderate uh, coagulation and a little more heat is generated. And when we get down to the partially rectified, remember this is 90% coagulation and only 10% cutting and so we get much more widespread coagulation and even greater heat. Finally, the action on the tissue, 90% cutting, 10% coagulation, 50% cutting, 50% coagulation, and with the partially rectified, we have hemostasis, and this, as I said earlier, would be electrosurgery. Again, just to point out, we've set this uh, on a dial of four to get started. Radio surgery is also used in cosmetic eye surgery. Here we see a pre-op view, and now we see a two-week post-op view of the level of tissue maturity when this instrument is used. This is this case we just saw, and I'd like for you to note the minimal amount of inflammatory infiltrate in the precise cutting that was done with a dental surgery 90 unit. Another indication of this instrument in medicine was where two conjoined Filipino twins were separated after a 17 hour operation. The lead surgeon in the case stated, radio surgery cuts and coagulates without generating extra heat and that was the key to separating these conjoined brains. Another video lecture will be on crown lengthening, aesthetic crown lengthening. The simplest form of this is as we refer to here is simple crown lengthening. This is removal of facial gingiva only. And on that video lecture, you will see compound crown lengthening and complex crown lengthening. Compound crown lengthening is removal of facial gingiva and facial bone, while complex crown lengthening is removal of facial change of a facial bone and interdental bone. So following the use of radio surgery, we see how the crown lengthening has been done in this case and compare that with what the tissue looks on the case we showed you earlier using the dental laser. This is a three week post-op showing better contours, not only on the central incisors, but also on the lateral incisors. This is a case where we see gingival asymmetry on the left and right. While patients can tolerate some level of gingival asymmetry on lateral incisors, any gingival asymmetry on central incisors is not acceptable to the patient. After using a tip to just simply incise with the radiosurgery unit, we go in there and take a curette and just pinch that tissue off. Following that, you can use a, a pointed tip to just finalize that, and this is the way the tissue looks in three weeks. The maturity you will note, and certainly the aesthetic improvement, which the patient thinks is wonderful. This is one of the most interesting cases that I ever treated. This lovely lady was in an accident about 30 years ago and traumatized the tissue on that central incisor, and this is the way the ginger change of proliferated. Obviously, when she smiled, she pursed her lip and it was very, and a very tense smile. But she had gone through 30 years looking like this. And on the lower right, we see after removing that tissue, which took probably 30 seconds to a minute. And this is the way she looked three weeks later. But this is so dramatic and shows what can be done and I think this is probably the most appreciative patient that I ever treated. In this case, a free gingival graft was done on the maxillary canine to increase the amount of keratinized tissue. Many free gingival grafts have a keloid look, which is unacceptable to the patient. So taking a tip and going in there and actually using it in a sanding motion we can remove that tissue and we note on the lower right the aesthetic improvement. 
We'll be talking about this uh, later in one of the lectures where we're going to be talking about the phrenectomy and as well as crown lengthening. And one of the things that we found for every millimeter teeth with a diastema are moved together, the tissue will move down one millimeter. This is a very significant uh, diastema, probably four or five millimeters. And when we pulled it together orthodontically, you can see how the tissue bunched up. And on the lower right, we can see where the tissue has been radio surged. We subsequently went in and did a phrenectomy as well. And there will also be a lecture on phrenectomy surgery and how it differs in the maxillary arch as differs from the mandibular arch. So look for those two lectures on our web textbook. So this is the way that it looks after we did the initial uh, uh, radio surge. And you can see the tissue is still a little immature. But something I want you to note is you will note on the left, uh, on the central incisor, on the distal, the tissue is lower than it is on the mesial, this area right here. This is the reverse that is true. And one of the things that we'll point out on the crown lengthening lecture is to point out that the tissue should be a half a millimeter higher on the distal facial than it is on the mesial facial to get a much more attractive emergence profile. It's better on the left central on this. You see that's higher. So simply going in there and doing a little touch-up surgery would be indicated, probably take less than 30 seconds to do. And plastic surgeons do not hesitate to go in and revise their surgeries, but we as dentists tend to feel we have to get it right the first time and we're hesitant to suggest any further treatment. But we need to get over that simply using that pointed tip electrode that we showed earlier uh, would certainly be indicated. In this case, we're using my favorite tip, which is rounded like a Bard Parker 15 blade, as contrasted to a 12B or an 11 blade. A mistake was made. Notice how deep I'm cutting and dragging that tissue. This results in this grayish tan area, which is coagulated tissue. Fortunately, this is going to be on the portion that is going to be discarded. Using this tip after we've done a straight line gingivectomy can then be used interdentally to get rid of the granulation tissue, which often takes so, longer, so long to remove in regular surgery. But just taking this tip and just spinning it in the area for about two seconds We'll remove that, and now we're ready to use a triangular electrode to put the bevel on. So you will see the completed uh, case uh, on the mandibular right. This is the three-week post-op, and we can see the tissue maturity. Initially, the maxillary arch following the, uh, the radio surgery and the three-week post-op. In this case, this patient was referred in by the Church Health Center, which provides a fee of $25 an hour to treat these uh, indigent patients. And a full mouth gingivectomy was done in an hour, and you can see the post-op result on that. So be careful, use a sweeping motion, and don't bear down and cut through the tissue like I did on this particular case. There's also two rounded tips of different size. One of them can be used to make an ovate ponic in the uh, lateral incisor area, and one of them can be made to do it in a central incisor area. So what you want to do is to go ahead, and if you want an ovate ponic done, go ahead and carve into the stone cast that you send to the lab what you want. They will make you the ovate ponic. When you get ready to seat it, it's not going to seat because you have tissue in the way. So just going ahead and taking swipes with a radio surgery unit, ultimately you'll be able to fit the area and end up with a most aesthetic result. For what you're seeing here is areas where the radio surgery unit not only can be used for periodontal surgery, but also has many uses in general dentistry as well. So here we see on the upper pre-op and on the lower 
we see the ovate site that was created. And this was actually the day of surgery because we're going to go ahead and fit the bridge to the area as we keep sculpting our ovate pontic site. We're all familiar with the soft tissue changes that can take place in the heavy smoker. And this is referred to as nicotine stomatitis. This unit can be used to touch up that area and end up with a much better contour and color and texture of tissue. Doing this is no substitute for smoking cessation, however. And another link on this web textbook will be discussing prognosis and periodontal treatment. This is referred to as the Miller-McIntyre Periodontal Prognostic Index where we can accurately predict the outcome of periodontal therapy and patient cooperation. Of the seven factors that we evaluated, smoking was by far the most significant factor. Patients taking calcium channel blockers often get enlarged fibrotic papilla, and when they come in on a recall hygiene appointment, when this is noted by the hygienist, she will explain to the patient what we can do and go ahead and anesthetize the area for hygienists in Tennessee can use a local anesthetic. Therefore, when I come in to check postoperatively, the patient's already anesthetized and I'll just take a minute or two just to plasty some of these large in, uh, fibrotic papilla. It takes so little time, often I would use that as a practice builder and not even charge the patient. Here we see these enlarged papilla, which can be plastic very, very simply and very, very briefly. This took so little time, often on a long-term patient, I would not even make a charge. Post-surgery gingiplasty. In this particular case, we can see where the tissue is kind of bunched up between this, this, this molar and premolar. Previously, the way this was treated was to place the patient on a rubber tip stimulator and over a period of time with pressure atrophy, they could reshape that papilla. But it's so simple to take the radiosurgery unit after putting in a drop of anesthetic and go ahead and plasty that area. No treatment is necessary, no follow-up is necessary, and you simply see the patient the next time they come in for recall maintenance. Another situation where we did regenerative surgery and the tissue has healed underneath, but the flap on the top has epitheliized, as you can see with the probe. We lift that area back, simply go in there with a the radiosurgery unit, plasty that, see the patient for recall several months down the line. A technique that we're going to show under the phrenectomy technique is the use of a lateral position flap to bring it come across the, the midline so that you get keratinized tissue and when you do a phrenectomy, you do not have the concavity. That was what was done on this case and look at the abundance of keratinized tissue on the pre-op and the, uh, the gingival contour that is not acceptable. So we went in there and did the radio surgery as you see on the lower and we have a three week post-op. So it's useful in ovate pontics, it's useful in frenal surgery, just has multiple areas to be used in dentistry, and later on we'll show you the use that can be done in orthodontic treatment. Here is melanin pigmentation, which uh, some patients would like to have removed. Now remember the melanin pig pigmentation is in the epithelium, it's very superficial. So using a electrode that's a round ball we can lightly touch this area, as you see here, and that will just go ahead and heal and slough a little bit and expose the pink gingiva underneath and get a more aesthetic result. And if you don't get it the first time, you can certainly come back and touch it up at a later appointment. So this is where it looks like where it's been, where it's been radio surged. And we see on the lower right uh, the way the way that that looks, a uh, more uniform uniform uh, color of the tissue. This shows where we're touching up in the electrode that was used for that.
and preoperatively what we see and postoperatively what we see. Now, the amalgam tattoo. This is a patient that had uh, an endodontically treated tooth, the result of a bicycle accident when she was about 11 or 12 years old with a blunderbuss canal, the apical surgery uh, doing which was unsuccessful. And when we flap this area back, you can see the defect present there. So we have taken underneath that black tissue up there and taken a piece of connective tissue and passed it underneath to elevate the amalgam tattoo. Here's a piece of, of connective tissue that was used. And as I said on the earlier slide, this is where it was inserted in and the area, the area sutured. Patient was seen three weeks later and you can see that the amalgam tattoo is still there. We allow that to heal for a couple of months. Then we go in and using the radio surgery, we've exposed that connective tissue. Again, note that with the radio surgery, we're getting no bleeding. And this is the way she looked the day we did that surgery and the way she looked three weeks later. The pre-op and the post-op showing the color of the tissue Yes, this could have been removed with a burr. Yes, you could have used a laser, but just showing the versatility of this instrument. And this is the way the area finally healed up. And finally, I'd like to thank Dr. Bradley Nierenblatt for the next couple of cases. This is a second molar that is coming in in an adolescent child, and we have an operculum over the top of it simply going in there and using the radio surgery and exposing that will prevent the patient from biting on that and making it sore and tender. Another of his cases, look how difficult it, difficult it would be without some crown lengthening in this case to put on orthodontic bands. There's abundance of keratinized tissue, 10 to 12 millimeters, so there's no need to worry about removing all of the keratinized tissue. And this is after using the radio surgery unit and notice that there is no bleeding and the tissue uh, maturity is going to be fantastic. And they could actually go ahead and band the patient the day the radio surgery is done because there is no bleeding and it's easy to isolate. Here is contact information should you want to order the Denisurge 90 unit. Currently the cost of this is around $3,000. For you who are international dentists looking at this web textbook, it comes in AC and DC. So please let the person you're ordering from be aware of that. I would like to emphasize that this web textbook is for educational purposes only and not for profit. No honorarium products or money was provided by any of the companies whose products are shown in these videos.